Okay, so welcome to the NCM workshop on finite groups of uh, the type. Uh, this workshop is uh, funded by uh, NCM, and the organizers are uh, I Anupam Singh and uh, Shripad, who is also here. Uh, uh, in this uh, workshop, there will be two series of lectures, uh, roughly 10 each, and it will be in the weekends, Saturday and Sunday. And the tutorials will be on Thursday and Friday. So the, for the lecture on Saturday, the tutorial will be on Thursday. And for the lecture on Sunday, the tutorial will be on the Friday, the following Thursday and following Friday. Uh, so the first series uh, begins today. And uh, the first lecture is going to be given by Professor Dipan Prasad. Uh, uh, and I request Dipendra to uh, start sharing the slide. Does it look uh, OK, Anupam? Uh, yes. If you can make it slightly larger. By... Uh, meaning, of course, I can make it the whole screen, but then I will. Uh, no, no, you can just you can just zoom maybe, uh, uh, which is 89%. If you just slightly. 89% at the moment. Uh, you see, I don't want to, uh, you know, this right, is right, the maximum. Right. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, okay, maximum. this is fine. I, I, no, no, okay, okay. There is a possibility to make yeah. it larger. Just this much, yeah. Maybe this, this is good. No, in fact, I, I did not realize that uh, this uh, has a, a scope for... Within, yeah, within this uh, window. Yes, yes. Okay, good. I, I am I supposed to start now? Yes, you can begin now. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Anupam, and thank you, Shripad, for uh, uh, suggesting me to speak uh, once again on the lean linguistic theory. Um, I guess I have spoken several times on this, uh, 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 starting maybe about a decade ago when we ran a program at the Tata Institute for one or two weeks uh, and I made notes and uh, mostly what I will speak is from those notes uh, okay so uh, yeah so I have already spoken on this uh, many times but I, I cannot say I understand it fully and therefore every time I I, uh, I uh, plan on giving the lectures, I have to uh, again revise my knowledge and in that revision uh, I, I see that uh, there are many uh, gaps and uh, it's uh, good to think about some of that and in fact that was the reason why I request, uh, I accepted uh, the suggestion of Sripad that uh, I should speak uh, on this because it's certainly something which I like a lot and uh, it's an occasion to think again. All right. So the linguistic, the yeah. So the linguistic theory is about <coughs> constructing certain uh, representations of finite groups of Lie type, which are denoted uh, as R, G, T, theta, where G is a connected reductive algebraic group over a finite field F Q. T is a maximal torus in G defined over F Q and theta is uh, a character on the finite uh, torus tfq so theta is a homomorphism from tfq to c star or it could also be treated with values in ql bar star which uh, which is what uh, it, it may be uh, required to be done the way the linguistic set up the context but uh, there is no difference between C star and QL bar star. So one can just fix an isomorphism. So <clears throat> this is what the linguistic theory uh, does. Uh, given a maximal torus and a character of the maximal torus, it constructs a representation RT theta. 
uh, which are uh, generically irritable, but uh, not always. Uh, if they are not irreducible, then they are finite sum of certain number of irreducible representations. And uh, making a finer analysis of the components of RT theta is a more difficult problem. But uh, RT theta themselves are irreducible in most cases. And uh, that is where the subject begins. So, these representations R G T theta are called the lean, uh, is called the dalin lustig induction of the character T of the torus uh, of the torus T F Q to the group G F Q, and it generalizes uh, what is called parabolic induction with which it coincides when T is a maximal, maximally split maximal torus in G. So I will come. I will come to uh, what is a parabolic induction, but it is just to uh, give you a slight introduction to uh, the lean lustig induction. That it it is supposed to generalize parabolic induction. Roughly speaking, uh, the lean lustig induction uh, is uh, so, so to say this kind of parabolic induction, which works only for split tori. Uh, and the real lustig induction is supposed to work for all tori. So it's a question of uh, doing induction uh, of, uh, without the presence of a parabolic, uh, so, uh, without the presence of a parabolic to do some kind of a parabolic induction with a torus which is uh, not split. Okay, so. It is known that if the torus is contained inside a Levy subgroup of a parabolic defined over FQ, then uh, this dalin lustig induction RT theta is parabolic induction of this RMT theta. So uh, the, this torus is uh, contained inside uh, another reductive group, and one can do dalin lustig induction. Uh, of this uh, character on T to M, but uh, this uh, M has become a parabolic. Uh, Professor Kulkarni has some question. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, your audio is muted, Professor Kulkarni. Okay, so I cannot. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, the mechanics were ignorant here. Uh, the uh, Eladic. A completion that is sorry uh, this elliptic completion and then its algebraic closure yeah that's isomorphic to C yeah it is isomorphic to C but you know I don't want to worry too much about such details uh, yeah but it, it, uh, is that, uh, how explicit is that isomorphic now no not specific it is like two algebraic closures are isomorphic. Right. Two algebraic closures of same cardinality are isomorphic. But there is also the completion there. Sorry? There is also the completion going on there. QL bar star. Yeah, there is a... Like closure, there is no completion. Uh, no, no, C has also transcendentals over Q. Right, right. No, but uh, QL also has a lot of transcendentals over Q. So, so it's not just the algebraic closure of uh, Q in no. the elliptic norm. I said any two algebraically closed fields of the same cardinality are isomorphic. Any two algebraically closed fields of the same characteristic and of the same cardinality are isomorphic. I think, I think Shankar Sen had some something to say on that. I, I don't remember now. Uh, who? Shankar Sen. Shankar Sen. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, that's okay. So, uh, uh, I was saying that in some cases, uh, this uh, new induction that we want to define, the lean lustig induction, uh, becomes parabolic induction, even in the cases when uh, the torus is not maximally split by, so to say, induction in stages. So, 
uh, uh, Rg t theta is induction from P to G of Rm t theta, which is a representation of the Levy subgroup M. And once it's a representation of the Levy subgroup, you are allowed to do parabolic induction. And then Rg t theta is uh, this parabolic induction. So thus Rg t theta are really new objects only for those maximal tori which are not contained inside any Levy subgroup of a parabolic P defined over a few. Because uh, if the maximal torus is contained inside a Levy subgroup, then Rg t theta is some kind of a parabolic induction. So uh, there is this uh, observation that maximal tori which are not contained inside any Levy subgroup are precisely those tori which do not contain a non-central split torus of dimension greater than equal to one. So uh, therefore, the lean lustig induction is new only for those uh, uh, tori which are anisotropic, which means that they have no split component. Yeah, so Dipendra, Dipendra I, ha I have a small question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so what do you mean by uh, parabolic induction? Can you yes, remind yes, me? I will come to that, uh, uh, Krishnandu. Indeed, okay. uh, uh, this was uh, somehow to set the stage for what the dalin lustig theory uh, proposes to do in All right. relationship to what it was done beforehand. Okay, okay, great. So, what I am uh, beginning uh, to say is that uh, uh, before dalin lustig parabolic induction was a well-known process. You know, if you are looking at a group like GL2, then uh, there are two kinds of tori. One is the diagonal torus, yeah. alpha, comma, beta on the diagonal. And then there is uh, what is called anisotropic torus, which uh, corresponds to, if you are more used to GL2R or SL2R, it corresponds to a circle. Yeah. You know, circle is uh, called anisotropic torus. And uh, what the lean lustig theory does, so what parabolic induction does is to be able to induce characters of the split torus. And uh, what the lean lustig theory does is to be able to induce characters of uh, S1 also. And okay. as I said, it's only some small uh, uh, difference of the tori but uh, it needs a large theory to do that. I see. Okay. So now, indeed, I will uh, define uh, this uh, uh, parabolic induction. But I think uh, before I do that, I, of course, uh, Manish Thakur has given some uh, uh, beautiful lectures on uh, uh, the classification of all uh, reductive groups. Uh, the theory for finite fields tends to be very, very kind of a baby theory of the general subject. Uh, things are really very elementary compared to the generalities that are done in the subject. But in any case, uh, I need to uh, refer to them. And uh, in any case, the subject is about uh, a torus inside a reductive group. That is where it begins, torus inside a reductive group. So I have to tell you a little bit about uh, a reductive group and a little bit about maximal tori. So uh, uh, indeed, uh, I do welcome interruptions. Uh, it will be good to uh, clarify if there were any queries. OK, so. Uh, a good example of a reductive group to keep in mind, although too simple for purposes of these uh, notes or this lecture, is the group GLN. Um, it may not be very clear to the audience why GLN is so simple. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, I can uh, quickly explain why GLN is so, so simple a group for our purposes. But anyway, it is. And uh, one can classify all maximal tori in GLN F2 as product of Ki star, where Ki are field extensions of F2 of degree Ni, such that summation Ni equals N. 
So you just take arbitrary field extensions of FQ, which add up, uh, whose degrees add up to N, and you look at the invertible elements and you form product, and that is a maximal torus. And uh, in fact, these are up to conjugacy, the only maximal tori in GL and FQ. And among these maximal tori, there is the split torus, which is FQ star to the power n, which as you see, these are the diagonal subgroup. And then there is one anisotropic uh, torus, which is FQ to the power n star. So, you know, you think of GLN FQ. So, I also have this uh, Wacom tablet. So, uh, you know, uh, we can. Uh, think about uh, GLN FQ as uh, automorphisms over FQ of an n-dimensional vector space over FQ, which we can take to be FQ to the power n. And uh, therefore, FQ to the power n star operates on FQ to the power n by multiplication and that gives you an embedding of this inside GLN FQ. So FQ to the power N star sits inside GLN FQ. Uh, sits inside GLN FQ. Uh, and similarly, these product of KIE star uh, uh, sit inside the corresponding GLN1, GLN2, and dot, 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 and product of GLNI sits inside GLN. Okay, so that is uh, a maximal tori in GLN. A Borel subgroup in GLN FQ is up to conjugacy, the subgroup B of the group of upper triangular matrices. So these are the group of upper triangular matrices uh, with non-zero entries on the diagonal. And parabolic subgroups up to conjugacy are those subgroups of G that contain this Borel subgroup. So it can be proved that the subgroups of G containing the group of upper triangular matrices are subgroups of the form GLD1, GLD2, GLDK. Uh, where uh, these di is equal to 1 and summation of di equals n and uh, up to conjugacy these are all the parabolics in the group gln so uh, there is uh, a decomposition of a parabolic called the levy decomposition so there is this levy decomposition uh, which writes a parabolic in terms of uh, what is called the Levy subgroup M alpha and the unipotent radical N alpha, where M alpha is product of GLDI FQ, which is called a Levy subgroup of P alpha, and N alpha is the unipotent radical, which is those stars. So uh, the uh, uh, M alpha is this uh, block diagonal matrices, GLD1. GLD2, GLDK, and uh, those star entries and the diagonal to be one, uh, block diagonal to be one, is the unipotent radical of P alpha, which is a normal subgroup. So thus one has a split exact sequence. One has a split exact sequence of groups in which you have a normal subgroup N alpha uh, inside the parabolic P alpha and M alpha is a Huh? Sir, sir in, in a split case, you have defined torus set of diagonal matrices. Sir, uh, yes, in an isotopic yeah. case, in, in answer topic case uh, what type of matrix you will define for torus? I, I mean, uh, are you talking about this FQ to the power N star inside GLN FQ? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. That is what I tried to define here. Uh, you know, in some sense, uh, the, the simplest example of uh, this is uh, the matrices which look like A, B, minus B, A uh, inside GL2R. GL2R. Sir, sir. And uh, this is, uh, C star equal to this, where A comma B is non-zero. And uh, yeah. Uh, 
सर इन जी एल टू एफ क्यू वी कैन डिफाइन एक्स प्लस बाई अंडर डी टू आई कैन सेंड एक्स एक्स बाई डी बाई एक्स करेक्ट बट instead of uh, uh, fixing an element which doesn't have square root in fq you know yes. i have done it by some uh, coordinate free way uh, sir uh, we will go by basis of uh, e over f or e, e cross over f or we will go any other way you know uh, if you look at how i did it uh, somehow I am identifying GLN FQ to the automorphism group of FQ to the power n over FQ, because you know FQ to the power n is n-dimensional vector space over FQ. Its automorphism group is by definition GLN FQ, and uh, FQ to the power n star operates on FQ to the power n FQ linearly by multiplication, and that gives you embedding inside GLN FQ. so i think the advantage of this approach is that you don't have to choose basis and uh, this aspect that you know you have to find an element with a square root etc or not a square root has been avoided uh, okay sir you, uh, but uh, you know in some sense uh, 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 for each field extension there is uh, uh the torus of invertible elements uh, sit inside gln yes sir as a uh, yeah as an abelian subgroup okay so yeah so i am still uh, perhaps uh, it is not necessary to go into classification of reductive groups but uh, in any case i have said that here the classification of reductive algebraic groups over k is usually done in two steps so the first step is the theory for k equals k bar algebraically closed fields and here uh, somehow the great uh, uh, realization of the mathematicians in the 20th century maybe was that there are no surprises and the theory is the same as for compact connected lie groups or for k equals c so whether you do things over f2 bar or over c it doesn't matter very briefly put the theory says that any connected reductive algebraic group over k equals k bar is a product of groups of type a and b and c and d and g2 f4 e6 e7 e8 together with some uh, issues on the center uh and uh, we have the classical groups a and corresponds to sln plus 1 bn to so 2n plus 1 cn to sp 2n dn to so 2n and the remaining groups are called exceptional groups about which you know a lot okay okay and then the next step is that you know first step in the classification program is to understand groups over k bar and as i said uh, if you are doing the theory over f2 bar then it is more it is the same as over c and uh, then the question is uh, what about the theory over f2 so uh, this is called the rationality question and uh, ne the next step in the classification program is to understand what are g prime over k for a given g over k such that over algebraic closure they become the same so this is often uh, called uh, k forms of a group g so such groups g prime over k are called k forms uh, isomorphism classes of groups over k which become isomorphic over k bar k forms so this question is intimately related to the arithmetic of the field k Uh, this is studied among other cases in the following special cases so for real numbers uh, this was uh, completed by ili kartman more than a century back uh, this can certainly be said for example forms of son or sopq this is often goes as silvester's law of inertia for k equals qp also one has a complete understanding which is both simpler than k equals r in some sense and slightly more difficult in some sense 
so in terms of simplicity for example uh, if you look at the groups of type g2 uh, g2 f4 and e8 over a periodic field there is no other group besides the split group so a split group is the only one and there is no other isomorphism problem and somehow uh, whereas over reals these groups are more complicated there are many forms and you have to keep track of them so real numbers are a bit harder uh, on the other hand the finite fields are uh, uh, almost as good as uh, algebraically closed fields here there are in most cases the only split rows and in the other cases one more which is quasi split and uh, i am not sure whether you people have studied uh, the difference between split and quasi split groups but uh, quasi split groups are also as so to say uh, simple minded as split groups so somehow it's okay so uh, for example groups of type bn cn g2 f4 e7 e8 have only the split form over finite field whereas groups of type a and d and e6 so these are the groups for which the dinkin diagram has uh, outer automorphism these are uh, yeah these are the groups with outer automorphism uh, so you can split them uh, you can also twist them using the outer automorphism to get unitary groups or uh, in the case of so2n there is the sign plus minus one so there is a little bit of uh, uh, non split uh, orthogonal group of even dimension or dimension is always split you know these things are related to theory of quadratic forms uh, and it's a well known uh, exercise that a quadratic form in more than or equal to 3 variable always has a zero or finite field so the, this statement is just a reflection of that that a quadratic form in greater than or equal to 3 variable is, uh, is split and uh, this one about so2n is uh, the problem is that there are quadratic forms of uh, rank 2 which are not split okay so good all right so you see for our purposes uh, an important invariant associated to a finite group is its order and uh, one of the fun exercises that uh, each one of us uh, has done at some stage is the uh, counting how many points there are in gl and fq and there is this uh, well known formula uh, the while group of g is normalizer of t upon t and this is another important invariant of a group and uh, the while group uh, certainly is indeed the uh, most important invariant of a reductive group uh, for uh, groups of type uh, an it is uh, the symmetric group on n plus 1 symbols for bn and cn it is uh, this uh, group which is also called hyper octahedral group and uh, for uh, dn it is a slightly smaller subgroup of this uh, a reith reith product or hyper octahedral group okay and uh, i do not know whether you people uh, have enjoyed thinking about wild groups of exceptional groups but uh, just like uh, exceptional groups their while groups are also quite beautiful okay so the while group operates on the torus hence on the character group of the torus and uh, you look at the polynomial algebra on the character group so uh, it's a well known theorem due to chevalle that uh, this uh, w invariants on the polynomial algebra is a polynomial algebra generated by certain homogeneous polynomials of certain degree called the exponents of g and uh, the exponents are very well tabulated uh, and again these are uh, among the most uh, uh, important information that uh, one needs to keep in mind so for e8 it is 2 8 12 14 18 20 24 30 i'm sorry i cannot say i know all the exponents very well but uh, they have one shoot 
so the product of the exponents is the order of the while group and the sum of di minus 1 is the number of positive roots and the point why i did all this is that uh, one can express the order of gfq as q to the power n where n, n is the number of positive roots times product of q to the power di minus 1 and that for uh, that for uh, gln or sln will give rise to that formula that i talked about and uh, these some of these statements can be succinctly uh, interpreted in terms of uh, this uh, limit formula and then there is this uh, beautiful observation that un fq is the same as gln fq in which you change q to minus q okay so this is my review of reductive groups and tori and now i will go to representation theory but maybe I should take a pause, and if there are any questions, I am happy to to discuss. And indeed, I welcome that you do ask questions. Maybe some people should ask questions just so that uh, others uh, uh, are encouraged to ask, and uh, it may also illuminate the theory for others. Okay. Uh could you go back to the previous slide one? Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, so what does GLN F minus Q mean? You know, it's a polynomial in Q. And once it's a polynomial in Q, you can uh, put uh, Q to be minus Q. Oh. You know, I mean, supposing it was uh, Q minus 1 into Q square minus 1. Then uh, you put q equals minus q, and then, therefore it will become q plus 1 into q square minus 1, which is uh, the order of q2 fq. So that q minus 1 has become q plus 1. q square minus 1 factor will remain as it yeah. is times q. So, I mean, uh, yeah, the orders are same, I understand, in the formula. Uh, but, uh, like... So, yeah, are you saying f minus q also has a meaning? No, uh, okay, no, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> okay. playing with uh, q uh, polynomials in q. And, uh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Somehow, uh, maybe it's suggestive that, uh, uh, but uh, it's also uh, quite suggestive of how gln and un are related. VLN and VLN are closely yeah. related by changing Q to minus. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Manish, you want to make some comments? Uh, uh, no, I, I I was just wondering if it will slow. I just wanted maybe you can tell how Levy sub subgroups look like if uh, it's possible. But don't don't spend too much time. Well, this is of course a, one of the important things uh, which goes as input in parabolic induction. And uh, as I said, for GLN, the Levy subgroup is product of GLNI. Was uh, something that uh, was uh, here. Uh, this was uh, this one, and uh, of course, uh, I make my living on classical groups, and there the Levy subgroups uh, are also products of this form. They are products of GL uh, DI together with a smaller classical group. So, if the classical group is SP two N then the Levy subgroups are product of GLNI times some SP2M. Right, right. So, the, uh, okay, so somehow uh, the Levy subgroups are supposed to be uh, smaller groups and uh, the inductive process uh, uh, means that you understand the uh, components of the Levy subgroup and you build the theory from Levy to the bigger group. So the, these are centralizers of maximal k-split tori, right? 
No, no I mean, uh, yeah, centralizers of maybe just split tori. Split tori, okay. Centralizers of split tori, because you know, if you look at centralizer of maximal split tori. Oh, yes, yes, they will correspond to minimal parabolic. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, minimal uh, levy, minimal Correct. levy. Uh, but uh, if you look at uh, other uh, split tori, then yes. they are sent, yeah. So indeed, that is. Uh, one of the ways to look at Levy subgroups as centralizers of split tori. Split tori, correct. And uh, so somehow, uh, maybe from that point of view, it's not totally clear, but uh, uh, the number of uh, parabolics, etc., is uh, finite up to conjugacy. And this set is also finite up to conjugacy. And uh, as I said, for classical groups, things are very, very kind of uh, uh, explicit. Right, right. One can describe the parabolics and the levy and the unipotent radical and so on very explicitly. Yeah. Thanks, Dipendra. Good. Dipendra, can I ask? Can I ask a simple question? Oh, no, please. You know, I mean, simple. Just question. for discussion. <laughs> yeah, yes. just for the understanding. Uh, how torus tori look uh, in uh, like unitary group right you also said uh, unfq yeah so for unfq you know maybe just uh, maybe two by a small uh, size example or something like that mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in some ways uh, yeah i used to know that well uh, Tori inside unitary group, uh, the way you do uh, something like Q G plus one appears instead of uh, like you know in GL it will be like Q minus one. Q minus one, indeed. So that is in some sense the general thing that hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I can explain something that. coming from FQ square or something like that. Yes, maybe. yes, very good. Yeah, you almost hmm. got the answer. So hmm. I think. Uh, uh, there is the same switch between uh, plus Q and minus Q. So mm -hmm. let uh, P be a maximal torus in uh, GLN FQ. And uh, that we know already is a product of KI stars. So associated to this torus, there exists a bijective correspondence between tori uh, uh, in GLN and tori T prime in UN. And uh, the correspondence is given by uh, looking at, uh, so to say, given this torus T, you think of this torus over FQ square you look at the norm mapping to TFQ mm -hmm. and you look at its kernel, call it T prime. And uh, uh, the correspondence is so set that uh, this T goes to this T prime. So uh, T goes to T prime inside UN. So, you know, uh, perhaps uh, uh, somebody must have done in these courses that uh, the tori are classified by uh, H1 of, uh, so to say, Galois group with coefficients in W. And this is same as conjugacy classes in W. Conjugacy classes in W. In W. And for the case of GLN, uh, this corresponds to conjugacy classes in W are partitions of mm -hmm. N. Partitions of N. And uh, you know the while group for uh, unitary group is also W. It may be a little twisted W, but uh, uh, in some sense, you can also take a, a torus uh, which is for which the wild group is untwisted wild group. So it contains uh, U1, 
cross u1 cross u1 and uh, f, uh, is equal to t and for this torus normalizer of t upon t is isomorphic to the symmetric group and there is no galva action and therefore yeah. if you set up that uh, identification of h1 galva w with conju uh, conju uh, no uh, so this is equal to conjugacy classes in w and this is uh, uh, yeah so the theorem that uh, i hope somebody may have done is a conjugacy classes of tori conjugacy classes of tori <laughs> So the tori are in bijective correspondence with conjugacy classes in uh, W, and therefore these are the partitions of N. And you know, when I said product of uh, Ki star, you know, Ki had degree Ni and summation Ni was N, and therefore to each partition of N, there was a torus. Right. And uh, I'm saying that the same story works for unitary group. Unitary groups. And uh, they also correspond. And uh, somehow, if you unfold the definition, then uh, this is what will come out. Mm -hmm. That there is uh, a bijective correspondence between tori in GLN and tori in UN. Uh, right. yeah. I, I am. Uh, not hundred percent certain that this works for any field, but uh, maybe this is no. This is not true for all fields, but it is certainly true for finite fields. All right. Uh, Good. Yeah. Uh, shall I? Yeah. Move Thank on? you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Uh, sir. Uh, so, at the, the place where you wrote the uh, size of the finite group of Lie type, so there you wrote a limiting value. So limit Q tends to one something like that. You know, once again, it was uh, suggestive because you know I am uh, manipulating with Q as a variable, and uh, although Q equals one may not be allowed, but uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, so does that does that limiting value have some significance? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's why it was written in some ways. Uh, you know, people think of the wild group as the group over the field F one. Okay. Uh, okay. So there is this well-known uh, analogy. Uh, if you look at, uh, yeah, so I don't know how to say that. A group uh, field with one element, uh, if you look at GLN uh, over F1, then maybe the only option is uh, the permutation matrices. and. Uh, but of course, it is not very precise. So, but uh, yeah. Uh, depend but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this. Uh, you know, it's a large subject. It is part of a large subject uh, in which uh, uh, somehow you try to prove things by, you know, analogy. You can bring in physics also. And, uh, <laughs> Dibinder, can I ask one quick question? Yes, yes, of course. So you mentioned about UN versus a unitary group versus GLN. Uh, uh, if you can say things for a general field. So the question I wanted to ask is, is it something uh, with respect to a split group and corresponding quasi-split group? You can describe tori in the quasi-split group uh, because of the twist. Uh, th that may be. I mean, uh, you are at the moment not uh, generalizing to all fields, but generalizing no. to all groups. No, in this case, uh, because you, uh, for over finite fields, you have quasi-split group. All groups are quasi-split. So, so starting from GLN, maybe. You know, what I was thinking was that the recipe that I have given huh, is right. very general. Correct, correct. I have the feeling that it 
more or less works. I see. Yeah, well, let it be. We'll, we'll think about it. Uh, as you know very well, algebra is with involution. Who correct, correct. Than you. Uh, so just like groups are algebra with involution, uh, tori are uh, maximal sub-algebra, hmm. which are left invariant by the involution. Right. And all I am doing is that uh, if I have uh, uh, got a, I think it's some simple statement that if you have a commutative algebra, containing uh, the quadratic field E over F mm. and an involution which is non-trivial uh, on E, then uh, the quadratic, uh, the, then the algebra is tensor product of that kind. Oh, right, 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 right. I think uh, that is some uh, simple Galois theory. Yes, yes, yes. So any commutative algebra over E together with the involution, which is non-trivial on E, is the fixed points of the involution tensor right. with E. That's kind of obvious. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. I agree. Yes, obvious and that is all that I have in mind. We will but discuss this in tutorial session. I, I One can do this easily. One can do this, indeed. Yes. Very good, Manish. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, in some ways, uh, uh, Maybe because one knows GLN so much, one has some comfort factor, but uh, UN um, always is a bit more tricky. Right, right. right. UN is a bit more tricky, but uh, I think if you look at this compact torus, U1 to the power N, then its wild group is simple, as simple as the wild group of GLN, and uh, somehow. Uh, this duality works, T and T. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, with all these uh, uh, comments about Torai and reductive groups and their orders, now I want to say something about uh, representation theory. So, let G be a reductive group, P be a proper parabolic. So an important part of the subject of representation theory of finite groups of Lie type is to study the principal series representations, which by definition are these representations induction from a subgroup P to the group G of a representation rho, where rho is an irreducible representation of MFQ. So, you know, in some sense, I may just want to emphasize that um, parabolic induction is some kind of induction, but it is, one has to just be a little careful. So it is uh, induction from P to G of some representation rho, where rho is a representation of P. Is a, So it's not a representation of P, rho is a representation of M considered as a representation of P. So you know there is a mapping from P to M I talked about, Levy decomposition. So M is a quotient. It's not a normal subgroup, but a quotient group. And therefore, any representation of M rho ought to be gives rise to a representation of P. And that is what you induce to construct a principal series. So these are principal series. So, you know, principal series representations uh, uh, have been around, so to say. Uh, one cannot say it is due to Harishchandra, but uh, mm, in some sense it is from antiquity. Uh, principal series representations have been studied, certainly by Gelfand in the 40s and 50s, and uh, even before by maybe Schur and Frobenius. So, uh, uh, these principal series representations uh, are induction of, from parabolic to the group of a representation of a Levy. So the decomposition of a principal series representation into irreducible components is in general a difficult problem if one is interested in complete character information, but at least their parametrization can be well understood. Uh, uh, then there is this basic definition that at irreducible representation pi of g is said to be cuspidal 
if it does not appear as a factor of any of the induced representations. So take P to be a proper parabolic, row and irreducible representation of the levy and do this parabolic induction. So representations which uh, uh, arise in this process could be called principal series and which don't arise by this process are called cuspidal. So any representation of GFQ can be understood in terms of cuspidal representations of GFQ and of Levy subgroups. So somehow uh, cuspidal representations are building blocks of all representations. Once uh, you uh, know cuspidal representations of all the Levy subgroups, including the group G, then you, uh, you are in position to understand all of them. Okay, so uh, it is a very useful notion to uh, have associated to a representation of GFQ. There is a representation called the JK module pi n of MFQ of the Levy subgroup, which is just look at the fixed points of uh, n in pi. And uh, since n is normalized by m, pi n is a representation of MFQ. So these JK modules are uh, very important in representation theory. Uh, yeah, so a representation is cuspidal if I know leave all its JK modules are zero. That is just uh, Frobenius reciprocity. So uh, I presume uh, people know Frobenius reciprocity. Frobenius reciprocity it is something like induction from H to G, you know, H to G of pi 1 to pi 2, the home space in terms of G is isomorphic to home over H of pi 1, pi 2 restricted to H. And if you apply this to parabolic induction, you will see that uh, this JK modules come up naturally because the representations that are considered in parabolic induction are trivial on N. Okay. So uh, there is this uh, well-known philosophy of Harishchandra called uh, uh, philosophy of cusp forms. So I already said that cuspidal representations are building blocks of all representations and this is made precise in the following theorem. So let pi be an irreducible representation of GFQ, then there exists a unique associated class of parabolic and a unique cuspidal representation of the Levy such that pi appears in that, such that pi appears in this uh, principal series. So here uniqueness means that the pair m comma rho is unique up to conjugacy by GFQ. So the Levy subgroup, so somehow it is part of the theory, perhaps not totally trivial, that uh, parabolics don't matter, it is the Levy's which matter. But maybe that is a subtlety which is not so commonly considered and therefore I will not worry about it too much. Uh, you know, for instance, if you look at GL2 and diagonal matrices, then the diagonal matrices are contained both in upper triangular or, or lower triangular. And you can try to build parabolic induction using either of the two. And uh, it needs, I think, some effort to prove that these two things are the same. I think the point of course is that uh, upper triangular and lower triangular are uh, conjugate, but when you try to conjugate, the uh, torus also gets conjugated. Alpha beta goes to beta alpha, whereas you wanted to keep the same alpha beta. So there is some small issue to be resolved there. 
it is equivalent to saying that the principal series uh, uh, on GL2 coming from character alpha comma beta on the diagonal element is the same as the principal series beta comma alpha. And uh, that is true, but uh, maybe not so trivial. Good. So uh, there is, uh, in the subject of reductive groups, there is a notion of associated class of parabolics. So these are parabolics which are non-conjugate, but their Levy subgroups are conjugate. So parabolics are not conjugate. OK, so uh, there is this word, a, a unique associated class of parabolics and a unique uh, cuspidal representation. So here, uniqueness means that the pair m comma rho is unique up to conjugacy by g of q. OK, so because of this theorem, the classification of irreducible representations of g of q, it splits into uh, two parts. One is to classify cuspidal representations of all Levy subgroups, including G, and then understanding the decomposition of induction from P to G of a cuspidal representation. So, in some sense, uh, uh, Green is the one who somehow began the modern study of uh, representation theory in some generality. And uh, he wrote a paper which he is still uh, considered a fundamental paper on GL and FQ, in which he answers both these questions quite completely. So the Levy subgroups of GLN are GLNI, product of GLNI, and therefore uh, the question is uh, to classify cuspidal representations of GLNI and uh, to understand how does the induction decompose in terms of sum of irreducible representation. So, so first, the first order of business would be if the representation is irreducible to find conditions under which the induced representation is irreducible. And uh, if it is not irreducible, then to say uh, which representations appear and with what multiplicity. So uh, I think uh, these are all uh, already for GLN uh, a bit subtle questions and Green answered them all. Okay, so here is the theorem that Green proved. Okay, so uh, which is to uh, classify cuspidal representations of GLN FQ. Uh, the, uh, so, for one, cuspidal representations of GL and FQ are in one to one correspondence with regular characters FQ to the power n star to c star up to the Galois action of FQ to the power n star over FQ. So, a character is called regular if chi sigma is not equal to chi for all sigma not equal to 1. So, uh, regular characters, yeah. So these are the characters, uh, yeah. So a character is regular if and only if it doesn't come from norm. Maybe this is a good exercise for tutorial, maybe too elementary exercise. Chi from FQ to the power N star to C star is regular is not regular if and only if it factors through uh, so you have the norm mapping from fq to the power n star to fq to the power m star and uh, then some character c star chi prime and this is the norm so for some m m uh, dividing n so that uh, 
f q to the power m is contained. So um, uh, for GL2, we would be talking about f q square star and those characters of f q square star which factor through the norm are non-regular characters and uh, they are very few in number compared to all characters which are you know on f q square star they are q square minus one characters uh, and the ones which come from the norm are q minus one so most of the characters are indeed mm, regular okay so here is the green's theorem uh, for a regular character on f q to the power n star to c star there exists an irreducible cuspidal representation pi chi of gln f q such that uh, uh, its character theta chi has the property that theta uh, character of this representation at an element uh, so you know this is uh, called the jordan decomposition of the element s times u s is semi simple u is unipotent they commute and they it's the what is called the jordan decomposition for finite groups, it is something quite simple-minded. Uh, so if this element S doesn't belong to the field, then the character is zero. And if the element S belongs to the field, FQ to the, uh, F2, FQ to the power N, and suppose it divides, uh, you know, it generates FQ to the power D, then the value of the character at such an element S times U is uh, given by the value of the character chi at the element s together with its Galois conjugates multiplied by this factor where uh, uh, q to the power d the, this d is the field q to the power d and the number of factors here is t where uh, t plus one is the dimension of the kernel of u minus one so you know, a unipotent element has uh, what is called Jordan decomposition and uh, uh, dimension of kernel of U minus one is the number of Jordan blocks. Maybe another exercise is that uh, dimension of u minus one is uh, now dimension of kernel of u minus one is equal to number i mean uh, maybe this is all obvious things but uh, Anyway, for somebody who is uh, beginning to study, it's a good to double check. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the theorem. Uh, it is about, uh, I guess I have stated it only in one direction. But uh, so to a regular character, there exists an irreducible cuspidal representation and all the irreducible cuspidal representation arise in this way. And uh, two cuspidal representations, pi, chi1 and chi2 are the same if I don't leave chi1 and chi2 are Galois conjugate. So somehow the way I have written, it seems to have been missed out that uh, all the cuspidal representations arise in this way and pi chi1 is isomorphic to pi chi2 if and only if chi1 and chi2 are Galois conjugate. Okay, so then about this question that I have been talking once in a while, to understand the decomposition of the induced representation for rho a cuspidal representation of MFQ, uh, in the case G equals GLN, it suffices to understand the decomposition of sigma cross sigma cross sigma, a representation of GLDM FQ obtained by parabolic induction of the representation uh, sigma tensor sigma tensor sigma of GLM FQ to the power D considered as a Levy subgroup of GLDM FQ. The problem gets reduced to understanding the case when sigma is a trivial representation of uh, GL1 
uh, and uh, mm, so that is the question which is uh, which is uh, uh, what uh, one needs to understand you do induction from b to gln fq of the trivial representation trivial one and uh, the dimension of this representation is uh, dimension equals cardinality of g mod b. And the question is how does, so this is a GLN FQ representation. And the question is uh, how does one decompose this? So, you know, if you call uh, this representation, let's say PS, principal series, then I think one of the first results, which is a consequence of Bruja decomposition, is that endomorphisms of this over G, its dimension is, uh, no, not just the dimension, but it is, in fact, isomorphic to the group KG. And therefore, uh, uh, as K, K W, sorry, K W, and uh, uh, therefore this one uh, decomposes as uh, sum of uh, irreducible representation uh, which appear with certain multiplicity equal to the dimension of irreducible representations of the wild group. So therefore, PS is parameterized by summation of uh, one might say phi lambda dimension of lambda where lambdas are irreducible representations of SN. Can I, can I ask a question here? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Like K here, when you said that the endomorphism algebra is isomorphic to KW, so you mean over complex numbers or? Uh, just now in the yeah here you have written kw right okay. no no i mean uh, you are right absolutely right so i mean these are all complex vector spaces and it is cw uh, So I think the point somehow is that there is an action of W on this uh, uh, module PS and uh, that allows one to think about PS being a module both for W and for G and uh, mm, the representation uh, decomposes uh, with respect to the two accents uh, together. Yeah, anybody else? One more question I have. So this is Green's theorem for GLN. So will there be, I mean, I, is there something that you're going to say about G, like general G also? In this you know, group? this part of the theory that uh, uh, the, uh, what is called the endomorphism algebra of the principal series uh, is, uh, is generality. Mm -hmm. uh, not know whom to refer to, but uh, uh, in general, this is called uh, a Howlett Lehrer theory. But uh, I have the feeling that uh, uh, their work is. Uh, 
much more uh, a complete result and then the results for uh, principal series of the kind that we are talking about uh, um, again is maybe from antiquity you know it is uh, uh, more or less direct uh, there is some work perhaps yeah so more generally it's the same result uh, their result is exactly the same uh, for general group uh, how let lehrer theory yes uh, so they for uh, when you induce it from a cuspidal of a levy they put a co cycle but it was yeah. later proved to be the trivial cycle is mostly trivial i right. have the feeling that uh, it is not always trivial but uh, but it uh, was later proved to be always trivial in finite reductive, you always get trivial. I thought and there are some cases of one of those E8 groups, which is uh, in which uh, Lustig found there is some small obstruction. No, it was uh, several years later. Uh, Geck proved that the co cycle is trivial. It's a proceeding. Yes. Okay, no, so this is possible, Manish. Uh, in some ways, uh, as I said. Uh, uh, for principal series coming from Borel, it is an archaic result. Uh, Howlett Lehrer uh, did something in the mid 70s. Uh, but as Manish says, that maybe some things were still left undone. And uh, uh, did you say Geck completed that? That's right. Yeah. All right. So, fine. Uh, uh, but the endomorphism algebra of uh, principal series induced from uh, general cuspidal representation on the levy is uh, certainly well considered and uh, mm, yeah so this is the uh, yeah so in this theorem just to respond to puja uh, indeed uh, the, 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 this theorem is true for all groups all reductive groups Right, like when you replace one by sigma, then you have to replace w by w sigma. Right? The w sigma. Correct, correct. But you know, in some sense, I got uh, partly confused myself. Uh, uh, you know, what does it mean to say these two things are isomorphic? Does it mean abstractly isomorphic, or is there an action of the wild group on uh, induced representation which uh, gives rise to an isomorphism? I would prefer the second one, but uh, I think the second one is maybe not so simple. So okay. the standard basis, uh, standard way you would compute the basis of the endomorphism algebra does not multiply as a group algebra. That's what. So in some sense, there is some subtlety there. And there is a know, subtlety. Yes. There is a subtlety, and uh, uh, that subtlety one has to keep in mind. So what does isomorphism mean somehow? You know, I mean, the best way the isomorphism would be that there is an action of W on induced module, which gives rise to an isomorphism of CW into the endomorphism ring. You know, this is what is called, uh, in some sense, this is what happens in Schurweil duality and uh, so on, that uh, you have uh, one group uh, G which is operating and another group W which is operating and together it's multiplicity free and this is what one is saying but one is not quite saying that simply. So I think uh, there is some uh, small detail here or I would say only small detail but there is some detail here due to tits which goes into some generic algebra business and so on which I am forgetting. Okay, so Puja, are you okay with? Uh, yes, yes, thanks. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Good. All right. So I, I will continue. Uh, uh, let's see where we are. So, yeah, so I was just stating Green's theorem. Uh, I think. Uh, everyone in the subject should know that uh, cuspidal representations of GLN FQ 
correspond bijectively to regular characters on field extensions of degree n. Uh, but you know, one must realize that uh, it must have been, uh, it was a lot of hard work for Green to prove this theorem and then to compute its character values is, uh, I think, an enormous task. Okay, so, right. So I think uh, I will just uh, maybe begin with the linguistic theory. Uh, I have one more lecture. Uh, okay, so we fix some notation for any integer n, uh, it is common to denote by np the p primary component of n and n p prime n by n p. So if the number is co prime to p, then uh, the p primary component is one and n p prime is n. If the number is p to the power k, then the p primary component is p to the power k and n p prime is one. So uh, then I define this sign associated to a reductive group G. Uh, you know, it's amazing how important this sign is. So to a reductive, yeah, so a sign epsilon G associated to a reductive group uh, is minus one to the power rank of the group. So RG is the dimension of the maximal FQ split torus in G. And you know, I think uh, part of what we will uh, be doing is that uh, this allows you to construct a function on a group G. So you, to each element, uh, you associate the sign of the centralizer of the semi-simple element of that element. Yeah, maybe as one more exercise uh, for the tutorial, uh, you know, uh, I said uh, Jordan decomposition. So, you know, I think uh, if uh, G has order N equals one, then uh, uh, one can write, uh, so, you know, one can write this N as uh, uh, N in terms of N P times N P prime, and these two are co prime, and therefore they are numbers A N P prime plus B N P is equal to one and therefore g is equal to g to the power a and p prime times g to the power b and p and uh, uh, this element uh, has power it is unipotent and uh, this element is semi-simple because it's uh, n p prime is equal to one, and therefore you have written uh, g as g u times g s uh, with g u a power of g and g s a power of g. So the Jordan decomposition, you know, I mean. Uh, it is one of the great discoveries of Chevalier that there is a Jordan decomposition for any reductive group over any field, but uh, over a finite field, there is no issues. I was just saying that uh, this sign epsilon G allows you to define the function on the reductive group by saying epsilon G of an element to be epsilon of the centralizer of the semi-simple element, which is a reductive group. Okay, so the conjecture of McDonald said that to every maximal torus in GFQ, they, and a character on the torus, which is regular, in the sense that uh, theta w is not equal to theta for any element uh, in the while group, which is defined here. So one needs to be careful, there is something called absolute wild group. And then there is this kind of a wild group. And uh, to make, make matters worse, there are many kinds of wild groups. So this wild group depends on the torus. 
there exists an irreducible representation pi theta of g of q of dimension given by this whose value on a regular semi-simple element is non-zero only if the element belongs to the torus up to conjugacy and the character of uh, this representation at a regular element in tfq is given by epsilon t times epsilon g times this sum of the conjugates of the character. Further, uh, the character chi theta at unipotent elements is independent of the character theta chovian. And uh, this value is called the Green's function. Because it is independent of theta, so it's a function on the unipotent elements. It's a function on the pair of tori and unipotent element. And uh, it's a certain polynomial in Q called the Green's function. So perhaps I will just end my lecture today by just recalling that uh, uh, one knew already from Green's work uh, a lot of things about GLN. And just to recall that the dimension of a cuspidal representation of GLN FQ is this product, product of Q to the power i minus 1, i running from 1 to n minus 1. So the way to remember is that for GL2, it is Q minus 1. For GL2 FQ, the dimension is Q minus 1. And for GL3, it will be Q minus 1 into Q square minus 1 and so on. And if you look at the order of these finite groups that uh, we discussed in the beginning, you will see that it is uh, P prime, uh, uh, GLN FQ P prime because you know that went from maybe q minus 1, q square minus 1, q to the power n minus 1, minus 1 uh, upon cardinal t, tfq. I'm getting a bit confused. Cardinal t, ah, tfq. So that is q to the power n minus 1. So you know, in the order of gln fq, there was one more term, q to the power n minus 1 and cardinal t of tfq is q to the power n minus 1. So it it, uh, it works well. And for gl2 fq, as I said, the principal series are induced from characters alpha, beta, and their character values are alpha x, beta y, plus alpha y, beta x. And for discrete series, the character value is negative. And uh, this sign is uh, what is captured in these factors. Epsilon t times epsilon g. So if uh, you look at the split torus, then the sign is uh, just one moment. Uh, if the split torus, then the sign is one, and for the other torus, sign is minus one. So uh, maybe I stop here, but I am happy to take some questions, and uh, yeah, well, we will continue next time. Thank you, Dipendra. Anyone has any question? Sir, these regular characters are related to some uh, regular representation of FL2, FQ cross? No, regular is in the sense of, you know, you know, regular element in a group. A element uh, in GLN FQ is called regular if uh, somehow it has distinct eigenvalues. No, a diagonal element is called regular if under the while group action, it has no fixed points. No, sir, I am, I am asking uh, because you can simply say character. I am talking about characters on FQ to the power N star. And I said on FQ N star, there is the Galois group which operates. And I am saying that uh, in this definition, regular character means that the Galois group has uh, n elements in the orbit. So it's regular in that sense that uh, diagonal element is regular if uh, under the while group action, no conjugate of it is itself, no non trivial conjugate is itself. So a character on the torus FQ to the power n star is regular if no non trivial element of the Galois group fixes it. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir? Yeah? 
सर गिवन एनी जुडिशियल रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ अवर ग्रुप जी कैन वी से दैट इट इज एसोसिएटेड टू टू सम कस्पिटल रिप्रेजेंटेशन दैट इज व्हाट यू नो वाज व्हाट वाज दिस थ्योरम दैट आइदर इट इज कस्पिटल और इट इज नॉट कस्पिटल एंड इट अराइजेस फ्रॉम अ कस्पिटल रिप्रेजेंटेशन सो इफ यू यू नो दिस इज फिलॉसफी ऑफ कस्प फॉर्म्स दैट आई टॉक्ड अबाउट it says exactly what you are asking that uh, any irreducible representation uh, there is a cuspidal representation either of the group g or of a levy group such that pi gets uh, embedded inside this principal series so somehow cuspidal representation of the group and of the levy subgroups are building block of all irreducible representations okay you know um, i mean uh, to keep some analogy in mind it helps and you know uh, we all uh, know that in group representation theory one is told that the representations are in some bijective correspondence with conjugacy classes and uh, in some sense uh, principal series are related to uh, the no cuspidal representations are related to those conjugacy classes which don't sit inside levy subgroups yes sir so they are elements you know like uh, the, those elements uh, of uh, so2 inside gl sr2r you cannot diagonalize them okay sir good anupam mm -hmm. Uh, sir, you were uh, you were question on Jordan decomposition. Can you go to the slide? Uh, sorry, I have not really uh, heard you properly. Uh, can uh, you go back to the Jordan decomposition exercise slide? Yeah, yeah, Jordan decomposition. In fact, it was more like a uh, tutorial uh, uh, exercise, which I anyway did it. You know, uh, Jordan decomposition will become important in uh, all aspects. and uh, uh, i was just saying that the jordan decomposition for a finite group uh, writes down an element as product of powers of an element which are uh, order uh, prime to p and order multiple uh, power of p and uh, this can be done by a simple uh, arithmetic and uh, yeah you have a question yeah what is the what is the, why p prime element is important specifically the g to the power uh, the p power, power elements, elements are nil, uh, unipotent and p prime are semi simple so uh, what's the role of p here p is the gln fp gln f oh, okay you know it is the underlying uh, yes. characteristic of the finite p yeah, okay okay thank you sir thank you Manish, you uh, no, no, no questions. No, no, not questions. Comments. <laughs> yeah. No, no comments. <laughs> yeah. So, ca can you say something more about that epsilon G? You know, I, in some ways, uh, it looks very simple, but you know, it must be jumping around a lot. you know it's defined on all all of the group no i as i said maybe i did not uh, right. write properly i am saying that uh, uh, there is a mapping from uh, epsilon from the group g to plus minus 1 which sends uh, epsilon of g uh, uh, is epsilon of s is equal to epsilon of the centralizer of s and the connected component and uh, where uh, g is equal to s times u uh, product of semi simple and unipotent like above so it defines you a function from g to plus minus 1 uh, yeah i don't know uh, shiv in fact uh, you know in all these distinction problems etc and the the works of uh, hakim and 
you know, Hakim and Murnagan and all of them and uh, more recent works. Uh, I think this function is playing a lot of role. And, uh, you know, if you, okay, if you look at for GL2, in some sense, uh, 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 in GL2, an element is, uh, uh, if it is semi-simple, then it is uh, either uh, diagonalizable or not diagonalizable. And on diagonalizable element, we are value, putting the value to be 1. And on non-diagonalizable non element, value minus 1. And uh, then there are these uh, elements which are uh, jet uh, central times a unipotent element. And on them, also we are putting the value 1. Center, then the centralizer is GL2 and yeah. So that's a class function, and uh, well, yeah. So I do not know sure uh, for uh, general groups uh, what kind of an object is this. Uh, I'm sure this is uh, okay. I mean, just to uh, 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 give some related name, I, I, you know, there is something called corporate science in our subject. And uh, I think this is related to the corporate sign. OK. But I think uh, uh, this comes up quite a bit in the subject, epsilon g. OK. So it will come now in the next lecture also? You know, it comes up, for example, in calculating the character of the Steinberg. OK. Yeah, yeah. Character of the Steinberg has this sign in it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can one say something about induction from a parabolic to the group of a irreducible representation, not necessarily cuspidal, in general? Yeah, you see, um, uh, because any representation can be obtained by induction from cuspidal, you get reduced to the cuspidal problem. So, uh, supposing you are doing uh, parabolic induction induction from p to g of rho and if rho is not irreducible then rho is not cuspidal rho is not cuspidal sorry sorry yeah that's what uh, cuspidal then a rho is contained so rho is a representation of m then right. it is a, uh, induction from let's say m prime to m of rho prime right and then uh, this uh, induction in the stages will say that uh, somehow induction from p to g of rho is contained inside induction from p prime to g of rho prime. Right. And now rho prime is cuspidal. So somehow it's not quite accurate to say that the problem reduces to cuspidal, but uh, uh, somehow Cuspidals are easier to understand, and that is certainly necessary to understand. So we get a larger class of representation, which might occur as components of induction from p to yeah, g of you are right. So in some sense, uh, but you, you see, uh, uh, this induction that you want to understand is contained in this induction of cuspidal. And supposing yeah. we know everything about this induction of cuspidal, then you would say that you know uh, quite a bit about this induction. Right, right. Okay. I mean, supposing the bigger induction already is irreducible, then you are happy, no? Yes, yes, I'm very happy, yes. If the bigger induction is irreducible, then anything smaller is irreducible. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, although, uh, if there is a row which is contained inside cuspidal, and uh, so of course, a row could be equal to a cuspidal induction from a smaller group, then of course, uh, this is equal and then the problem is totally equivalent. So, you know, uh, it can right. happen that in fact, not only is this contained, but it is equal. And then this will be equal and then we are reduced to the cuspidal problem. Right, right. So, 
but you one may not be so lucky and uh, then there is some work to be done yeah sometimes one is only stuck with unlucky cases so just yeah yeah how to do no but uh, sometimes one has to bring luck by, no, uh, by at least it gives us a list of things which can be possibly arising as components and maybe that may be sufficient information yeah in it, it, right right indeed so i have the feeling that uh, the uh, when people talk about reducibility etc typically they study cuspidal reducibility typically right 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 all these famous works of shahidi and so on are right. in the context of cuspidal representation uh, i don't know i mean uh, of course uh, jelvinsky's papers are not necessarily for cuspidal so there is that template right right Thanks, Tipendra. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Good, good, Venkat. All right. So, if there are no more questions, I guess time to end.